You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 4, 2020, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Complementary and Alternative Medicine in Allergy. Our presenter is Dr. Christopher Miller. He's an assistant professor in the section of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Okay, <clears throat> why don't we get started? Um, for the second hour of COVID today, this is um, Friday, September 4th, 2020. Um, we have the pleasure of having um, one of our own faculty, Dr. Chris Miller, who's an assistant professor of pediatrics here at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. <clears throat> and he's uh, been on our allergy faculty for quite some time. Uh, Dr. Miller has had a longstanding interest in complementary and alternative medicine. I asked him to speak on that topic this morning, and um, I'm going to let Chris take it away. Thank you, Chris. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that introduction and happy to be back doing this here. So um, as Dr. Dowling um, alluded to, I'm going to be talking about complementary and alternative medicine, specifically in allergy, asthma, and immunology. Um, I have no financial disclosures. And here are the objectives for today is to define what CAM is to understand why individuals seek out the use of CAM, and review current data regarding the use of CAM and allergic dis disorders, and to discuss how to counsel the patients in their quest for that. And that's kind of a big part of this here um, in listening to your patient and understand what they're looking for. So I'm going to go through some definitions. Um, CAM means a complementary and alternative medicine. It's a group of diverse medical and healthcare systems, practices, and products that are not presently considered to be part of conventional medicine. And that's kind of in contrast to allopathic medicine, which is basically what most of us in this uh, discussion practice here. It's more the science-based modern medicines talking about use of medications and surgery and, and research to do what we do. Um, additional definitions here. So CAM can be divided into three categories here. There's some overlap in them. The first one is complementary, the second is alternative, and the third term we'll run into is com um, integrated. And a definition of complementary, it's, it's medicine that is used together with conventional medicine. So think of us as allopathic providers doing the conventional medicine, um, and then we're going to use something else to complement what we do here. Um, as you remember, the complementary is not necessarily all science-based, um, where w ideally what we're doing is. Um, some examples of that are aromatherapy plus analgesics for post-operative pain management or consider Tai Chi and anxiolytics for an anxiety disorder. And then alternative medicine is used in place of conventional medicine, so it kind of throws out what we normally would do and, and provides a different pathway. And an example of this is diet modification to treat cancer instead of surgery. And I know that sounds a little bit like really, but um, actually I've had individuals I personally know who have gone that route. So, and then lastly, integrated. Uh, integrated medicine is taking conventional uh, medicine and adding some CAM on top of it. It's kind of a combination uh, overlap between complementary alternative and conventional. Um, it's based on some evidence of, of safety and effectiveness. And so we're all aware of statins used for um, the hypercholesterolemia. Um, and then as, you know, for a long time, fish oil was being used, the data got a little bit richer, and then eventually it kind of became almost mainstay of what we saw in, in treatment here. Um, been around long enough to see many of these things come up and become very popular as data improved. And when data got finally summarized, then it kind of goes the other way. And I, I, if for those who've been around as long as I have, you'll know the vitamin D, A, E, all those have done the same thing. But anyway, at least for integrated, it's a combination of well-proven scientific information like our statins. And then um, um, over time, some of the what would be considered alternative became more conventional. So in quick summary, conventional medicine has, is ideally scientifically based and thought to be relatively safe and effective. I use relatively because we know all of our meds have potential for side effects in individuals. Um, 
and the efficacy is never 100% in some portion of that. And then uh, complementary and alternative medicine, um, it's, um, the, as we discussed earlier, um, some alternative pathways of treatment here in what was considered completely alternative eventually may become complementary and eventually may become conventional. So it's a moving target. CAM can be divided up into many different categories, some of these with overlap here. Um, one categorization um, is natural products, which will be the herbs or botanicals, your vitamins, minerals, and probiotics. can also be divided into mind and body practices, so think of your acupuncture, massage, and meditation, etc. You can read down that list there rather lengthy. Uh, we've got energy medicine, biofield therapies, therapeutic touch, light therapies, and bioelectromagnetic. And then we kind of have the other things that just don't fit in a, in a, a, a straight um, category. Um, the first one, um, Ayurvedic medicine. It's um, of Indian uh, subcontinent continent background, teaching of Hindu healers. And like many of these um, practices, they incorporate many different phases for healthcare. So um, yoga, meditation, herbal preparations, that's no different than our conventional because, you know, if someone's got back pain, we've got pain medications, we send them to physical therapy, et cetera. Um, Chinese medicine, we'll talk a little bit about Chinese herbal uh, preparations later. Uh, we've got homeopathy, um, light cures like, and serial dilutions. I've, I've kind of joked, alluded in the past about, you think about our immunotherapy, and we're taking what you're allergic and diluting it down and giving it to you. Um, but fortunately, we have science behind that too. And then there's naturopathy, um, which also uses kind of a combination pathway of different things to try to heal. All right, let's talk a little bit about regulation because this is an important part of understanding um, what's happened in the past, what's led us to where we are, and still the shortcomings we have with regulation. So um, the let's go way, way back. FDA was actually created um, around 1850 as an agricultural division. Um, obviously things were completely different way back in that, that era. By about 1906, um, the Pure uh, Food and Drug Act came out as a consumer protection, mainly against unhygienic conditions. And it was really related to cattle and meat um, production um, and um, what was being sold to people. And actually a lot of people were getting sick based on the foods that were out there. Um, and then by the early 20th century, medicinal herbs um, were, you know, coming, to, well, they've been on the market for a long time, but there was some noise about them. The uh, United States National Formulary and United States uh, Pharmacopoeia were created. Um, things were relatively quiet in the early uh, 20th century. By 1962, there was a lot of uh, um, noise about thalidomide. Um, so thalidomide was an a sedative anti-nausea medication um, used um, a lot in morning sickness and pregnancy. Um, for non-pregnancy conditions, it was actually very effective. However, um, as they started to become more popular, many pregnant women were put on it and the end result was um, the focomelia which are these limb defects seen in this picture here um, that um, you know, sparked an outrage here. Fortunately, uh, this was created over in Germany and spread throughout many um, so-called modern countries. Fortunately, the USA, the FDA had not um, approved it quickly, so little harm on our part of the world, but the bottom line is, and this is the big real deal, um, with that, the Kefauver Harris Drug Amendment was created. And with that, the, the amendment uh, basically said to drug manufacturers that you need to start proving that your medicines are effective and safe before they hit the market. Um, you had to require advertising to disclose the accurate information about side effects. So think about your package insert and that long list of things that could happen. And then um, you had to stop making cheap generic drugs being marketed as expensive new drugs here. And as we all know, there's a lot of name changes between generics and all. Um, you can go find eye drops that say, um, that, that advertise it, I won't mention the names, but a certain a common antihistamine company 
product name when it's actually even a different drug. So they're basically trying to come through and say, you know, you can't market it new, you can't make it is a super expensive new and greatest when it's really the same medication or just a name change. Um, unfortunately, with the, the um, new drug amendment, herbal medicines were switched over to a food supplement. So it removed them from the, the criteria of establishing it, lower threshold of required evidence for safety. Moving forward, 1994, Congress created the Dietary Supplemental Health and Education Act, and in that, um, it said the manufacturer of such products, we'll say like herbs and vitamins, um, they're responsible for determining that the dietary supplement it manufactures or distributes are safe, and that any representations or claims made by them are substantiated by adequate evidence to show that they are not false or misleading. The safe part is... Um, I'm not so sure it's like it's not required before it actually hits the market. They're just supposed to ideally kind of maintain their own safe profile, safety profile. Um, and any claims, and I, I, this is one I just cut off a, a very common um, vitamin shop website here. You'll see this on a lot of the supplements that it, it, it has the big asterisk that says these statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. The product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Um, when I read that, it makes me kind of chuckle because it basically says, we don't know that it does anything. But um, the, the market still spends billions of dollars on these products. Um, so, um, And then moving forward again, 2007, the FDA uh, issued new rules requiring good manufacturing pra practices uh, for dietary supplements. And these practices basically said that, um, they had to be properly labeled free of adulterants and manufactured according to specific standards for uh, personnel and equipment. Um, I'm going to give you some examples down the road of the adulterants component here. Um, it, it makes you um, raise your eyebrow a little bit when you see some of the stuff we're going to talk about. Um, and in 2010, 71% of the 626 FDA inspections of supplement, supplement manufacturers resulted in citations for not following these standards here. Um, so obviously there's, um, despite good intentions with rules and regulations, that really comes down to how do you um, police these things adequately. That's a hard thing to do. So in quick summary, summary uh, dietary supplements do not need approval from the FDA before they are marketed. There are no provisions in the law of FDA to approve dietary supplements for safety or effectiveness. There's the rules that say they should be, but there's no, no provisions to enforce that until after the fact. Um, and just to remember that dietary supplements are under the umbrella of foods, which is a just different category from the drug component. So. All right. We're going to change gears a little bit here, um, and um, you know why do we care about uh, complementary and alternative medicine as, as conventionalists? And I'm going to give you a long list of data here. I apologize, some of it's kind of outdated, but it's hard to find up-to-date stuff on it. Um, but um, let's talk just about healthcare delivery. What you're seeing in the blue of this circle here is the uh, um, the amount of healthcare delivery going to CAM compared to the orange is conventional medicine. So it just says percentage-wise, uh, visually, that, hey, there's a lot of folks using CAM out there. We'll get into numbers in a little bit. Um, the National Health uh, Interview Survey comes out every five years. Uh, I want to say that's by the, the um, CDC, if I remember right. Um, and um, the last one was in 2017, so you're not going to see more up-to-date data from them at this point here. Um, but you're going to see several slides coming up that's all pulled from that here. Um, what we're looking at here are the um, adults who use yoga, meditation, or chiropractic care in the last 12 months. The blue bars are showing the percent that use it in 2012, and the green is showing it in 2017. On the horizontal axis is yoga, meditation, and chiropractic. And the, the take-home point is it's all increasing. There's more yoga being used in 2017. There's more meditation, and there's more chiropractic. And are you guys able to see my cursor when I move it around? I'll take that as a yes unless somebody corrects me. Um, the next uh, component here, um, we're looking at the use of yoga, um, tai chi, and um, qi gong. And again, we're looking at 2002, 7, and 12. Um, take home on this one is yoga is just increasing in, in commonality um, use. 
and just to prove that this is not just an adult um, thing, um, children age four, uh, four to 17, 2012, 2017, across all three, uh, well, two yoga and meditation all went up. Uh, chiropractor went down just a little bit. So common use. If we look at just other data to prove that CAM is growing in interest, this is homeopathy providers. Again, old data here, but it, you know, significant increase through the years. If we look at herbalism, billions of dollars spent, another increase from 94 to 97. We look at number of massage schools here and dramatic increase in those. Um, this is actually a little more up-to-date data here, looking at the percent ch uh, change projected from 2016 to 2026 here. And in short, massage therapists are expected to go up 26%. Um, if we look at the number of chiropractors, um, they're going to be going up 12% in that same projected time. This is all from the uh, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, if we look at shelf space, which if you're in the marketing industry, shelf space is a big deal because they actually pay for a lot of that shelf space in prime spots. And this just shows that um, you know, the CAM growth and the amount of uh, shelf uh, space and lineal feed has increased through the years. And then we'll switch gears again. We're going to go through a, a list of kind of common use supplements of various types here. Uh, again, this is from the National Health Interview Survey. We're showing anywhere from about 1% um, up to 8% use in these supplements here, so pretty common through the population. Fish oil, um, glucosamine, probiotics, prebiotics are taking the, the major percent of that. Just another chart looking at adults using non-vitamin, non-mineral um, supplements in the past 30 days. Um, and anyway, it's from basically a half a percent about to one percent. And once again, fish oil and glucosamine take the lead. Um, I do a lot of uh, surfing just out of curiosity on, on this topic. Um, I found a website um, that sells the products. It sounds like a you know little store that you walk into type thing. And then what well, was just kind of fun? They they you know this is their list of things that you can get from them. Their herbal formulas. It's got the prices on it here and, and what they may add into it. Um, I do love the the part that if you bring your own clean bottle, you get a discount. But, um, those are out there, and obviously we're all pretty familiar with the large supplement stores that exist, whether it be the storefronts in your strip mall all the way to the online presence. All right, so why do people lean towards CAM? Um, so this is data from 2002 again, um, and we're looking at the percent of people that are um, using it for these various categories. So one, they thought uh, complementing alternative medicine combined with conventional medicine um, would be helpful. Um, and that was uh, roughly 55%. And then others just thought it'd be interesting to try. People like new and different. Um, about 27% thought conventional medicine would not help. About 26% thought con conventional, uh, well, I'm sorry, it was suggested by a medical professional to go that direction. And that's not uncommon. Uh, and then lastly, uh, conventional medicine is too expensive. And I always was surprised at the 13% because I know what our prices are like and they're ridiculous at times, but um, it was 13% said, hey, modern medicine is too much to, to bear. Um, if we look at the percent of people, adults here using CAM, um, the dark blue is ever used and the lighter color is in the last 12 months here. Um, so 75% roughly um, have ever used it, but 62% uh, are actively, meaning in the last 12 months here. If you take away um, mega vitamins, the numbers remain about the same. Um, if you exclude prayer, it drops down uh, considerably. You'll see in a future slide that prayer is a big thing. I think it's the next slide, actually. So here are the 10 most common uh, CAM therapies. Um, with that prayer, you will see once at 43, 24, prayer group down at 9.6. So prayer is a, a big component of this here. But if you just step over to um, like natural products, we're at almost 19% and goes from there. 
Um, as far as um, specific uh, supplements they may be using, this is in adults here, Echinacea seemed to want, win out quite a bit here. Roughly 40% of the people were using uh, echinacea. Ginseng, ginkgo biloba, garlic, and it just goes on here. Um, there are probably hundreds of these different products when you go looking at the, the websites here, but these are the most common ones we see being used. Um, and then what conditions are they frequently using, Cam? And the big theme on all this is going to be pain. We've got back pain, we've got neck pain, joint pain, arthritis, uh, stomach upset. I'm going to assume some of that's pain. Headache would be pain, reoccurring pain. So pain is a big um, reason that most people seek this out. And, you know, when you when you look at what we can offer, opi opioids are definitely not a long-term solution in any of this. So people are you know, trying to say, what else can I do? Obviously, um, exercise, physical therapy, and other things can be very helpful. Um, stress management um, it can be helpful for all these things, but none of those are a quick fix. So people are searching for something else. We're gonna talk a little bit about money spent here. So this is uh, national expenditures on, on CAM from uh, looking at 2002 to 2008, their age, or, uh, excuse me, adjusted for inflation along the way. And this is looking at different um, practices. And you can see by the red that chiropractor eats up the bigger chunk of everything here. Um, maybe a little slight trend up on this here. You gotta remember in 2008 is when the market went down. So I think expenditure probably went down too, but massage and chiropractor are um, some of the big expenses out there. Um, this information or the number of ambulatory visits in millions um, and I don't know if there's a significant trend, again, the, the economic recession at 07, 08 timeframe at the end there, but, you know, it's pretty easy to say, you know, there's roughly 120 million visits per year, so there's a lot of people seeking uh, care. Um, these are out-of-pocket expenditures. Um, I think my take-home on this, other than just looking at billions and billions of dollars, adult cost at 28.3 and children at 1.9. But just looking at the pie chart, this big chunk right here basically is adults. So adults are definitely um, using this more. Of course, there are probably more adults in the U.S. than there are kids. And shifting gears once again. So why do people go to for CAM? Um, We've got seven points that are going to bullet. I'm sure there are more, but number one, it gives the patient or the family an active component to their uh, health care. They, they actively feel like they're doing something. They searched out, they read online, they made the purchase. Um, they may perceive that CAM is risk-free, safe, natural, and inexpensive. Um, they can look at it as preventative. So think of like mega vitamins. If I give my child this super vitamin that claims to do all these wonderful things and I've actively participated and made them feel better. Um, in some ways it puts a provider and a patient on equal hierarchy. We all get that we're challenged frequently with people coming in who have read articles and done their research online and um, it's not a bad thing. Sometimes it makes the appointment longer, but it, it can be a good thing to have people trying to educate themselves the best they can as well as educate us. Um, they may have thought traditional medicine provided little cure, um, and I got to admit, you know, if we think about our asthma right now, we, we don't really have a cure for any of that here. We don't even know why they really got it, but we have lots of medicines that will help prevent their symptoms or lessen it. So um, that's true across a lot of medicines, so I, I can see why people are looking elsewhere. Um, it is easy to obtain, you know, you don't have to schedule the appointment, go and be seen, do insurance paperwork, all those sort of things. You just you can get it without a prescription. And again, there's a wealth of information online, whether it's correct or not, or scientifically proven is another thing, but people like to look into that. I'm going to talk a little bit about placebo effect, because I think it's important to realize when people say these medicines work, because, you know, not I'm different than when we put somebody on a inhaled corticosteroid, we ask, did this help? Um, and um, you're going to hear some of the, the their supplements do help. Some of it may be true help and some of it may be more placebo. So placebo come, is a Latin word. It means I will please. Um, if you go into the placebo effect and look at it, Cochrane actually talks about it and says the discrepancies between objective and subjective findings in placebo use are there. But in summary, placebo effects are indeed significant but small in magnitude. So kind of think of that as 
um, you know, it, 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 some of these provide a little bit of extra relief compared to placebo. I'm going to give you a, um, just a quick study to run through here. This is on a, um, a New England Journal article, active albuterol or placebo versus sham acupuncture or no intervention in asthma. Um, and it's going to kind of show some of the subjective component of improvement with a placebo. So it's a double-blind crossover study, 39 patients. They're not used, but for chronic asthma on uh, four different treatments. The first treatment consisted of albuterol inhaler. That was the active arm. The second was a placebo inhaler. That's the first placebo. The next one was sham acupuncture, so not true acupuncture. That's uh, placebo number two. And then lastly was no intervention. Sorry, double slide. Um, all patients received um, each of the three interventions plus the no intervention session in random order three to seven days apart. So this is kind of a short-term study, but um, the pattern was repeated two more times for a total of 12 visits for each patient. And at each visit, they measured the lung function um, and um, self-reported symptom ratings were recorded. And what they found out is albuterol increased lung function. I think we can all understand that. Um, that placebo and the no treatment did not change the lung function. That's kind of as expected. However, the subjective reporting on their symptoms showed significantly and approximately equal improvement with albuterol, the placebo inhaler, and the sh uh, sham acupuncture. So essentially, we've got two placebos, the inhaler plus the acupuncture, and patients reported it helped. So when you look into complementary alternative medicines, you will find that there's a lot of lack of studies. And when I go through some of the specifics in the world of allergy and immunology here soon, um, specific interventions, um, most everything comes back, not enough data. And, um, you know, as we go through this whole COVID crisis and look at any of the medications we're, we're trying to explore right now, as you know, everything's a small study and we got to get more studies and more studies and more studies and changes and doses and things like that. So um, I get it. It's confusing. Um, if you look at a drug that makes it to market, um, phase one all the way to market, um, and this is for you know, an FDA approved drug, it's, it takes about 90 months and about $802 million. Well, nobody's going to throw out $800 million towards um, does vitamin C do a certain thing. Um, or ginkgo biloba or whatever. So it's difficult to fund these things here. And then additionally, some of the uh, alternative therapies are kind of difficult to blind. How do you how do you do a blind study with yoga? You could do like non-recognized yoga movements, I guess, but you still, um, it, it'd be hard to do. Um, alternative plus, um, placebo to acupuncture, things like that. And also mechanisms are not always known for most of these therapies. So how do you kind of work around that you're not affecting that part of it? So. Anyway, it can be difficult and very expensive. When um, counseling your patients with um, ideas of complementary and alternative medicine, I think there's some things that are really important to build that relationship. And one is to listen to your patient here because they, they have done some homework here. They've invested some of their life and now they're coming to you. So listen to them. Don't be judgmental. Um, make sure you're looking at the most up-to-date information that you can, and I'm going to give you some tools on how to do that soon here. Um, don't push it all away. I, I kind of run towards the negative or used to on this stuff, and now I'm kind of like whenever somebody kind of challenges me with it, it's like, oh, great, I got motivation and some quick tools. I can go look and see what I know. Um, do talk about the concerns of efficacy and safety because everybody focuses on does it help? Help is great, but if it's chewing up your liver in the process, that's not a great thing. So you got to think about safety. Uh, and then certainly get a list of resources that you can share with patients. Um, resources here. I'm going to go through a long list here. Um, there's the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, which is part of the NIH, formerly known as the uh, NCCAM, renamed in 2014. And the mission of the uh, the complementary integrative health group here um, is to define through rigorous scientific investigation the usefulness and safety of complementary and alternative medicine interventions and their roles in improving health care. Um, I think it's, yeah, so and this is, like I said, part of the NIH, there's like 27 different institutes and this is one of them here. Um, it was established in 1998. Um, 
they're not huge. They had a, um, uh, in 2013, they had like 65 employees and their funding was about 121 million. Um, looking across all the different uh, therapies throughout that, you can see there's no way to really dig into that deep, um, but it's a start. And um, just here's some ideas of their funding here. Um, well, I got up to 2019 with 146 million, still not huge in the, the population of 350 million. Um, here's some of the topics that they will have on their website here. I'm going to show you the app in a minute, but things like traditional Chinese herbs and with asthma, vitamin E, asthma, allergic rhinitis, butterbur, et cetera. So there's a lot of different topics there, and I've got a link here. I'm going to try to see if I can make this work here and see if that helps. Um, Jordan, if you're out there, I'd let me know if this works for you guys and that you're seeing it here because I'm going to um, try to find the link here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of thought this may happen. It's not allowing me to go to it. Well, I, I'll, I'll say I've got a couple other links on other products. We'll see if I can get that to work too. Um, this is an app you can download. I have it on my phone too. It's a nice quick hit list here. Um, might might be worth getting. Um, that'll give you some quick information about it. I, I apologize since that link wouldn't work. Um, but it can be very helpful to be able to find something real quick on a, a certain herb that somebody comes in. Um, here's clinical trials here. Um, the clinical trials is another, another uh, part of the NIH here that gives you a lot of information of what's going on, what's currently being researched out there. Um, and this is an example of some things that they are looking at, like the magnesium and asthma. We know about meg sulfate, right? Um, fish oil and asthma, et cetera. And more examples of studies that they have looked at or are undergoing. Again, I'm going to try to, uh, darn it. All right. Unfortunately, I'm not being able to get to this. Um, <laughs> I promise you it's really cool. I just apologize and, and the uh, slideshow is setting on. I'm able to do that. Maybe at the end I can go back and see if I can find another way into that. Um, and then Medline Plus is, a, is another um, uh, NIH um, maintain um, database for you here that will um, give you a lot of information about the diseases, condition, and wellness issues. Um, it's pretty, you know, easy to understand. It's patient-friendly type of thing, too. And then, um, as you all know, Up to Date is a great resource there. There's um, um, about four different um, up-to-date chapters on complementary and alternative therapies and some very specific to what we do. And I've got a list of those four right there. All right. Now it's time for the a little bit on the negative side, unfortunately. It's the buyer beware. And this is, is understanding what's out there and counseling your patients um, along the way. Um, first of all, remember we said this is all dietary supplements at that point. Um, they have to be meet the following, so it's got to be a product other than tobacco that is intended to supplement the diet and that contains one or more of the following and it vitamins, mineral, herbs, etc. Um, it has to come in one of these forms, not sure why that's there. It can't be represented as a conventional food or as a sole item of food, so it's not um, a full meal, so to speak. It has to be labeled as a dietary supplement. So that's really kind of the weak guidelines of that here. Remember, we said it's a food, not a drug. It's a supplement. Um, remember, they're advertised as natural, but the question mark is, is it safe and effective? You got to start thinking about contamination. Good example coming up here in a minute. Um, and you will see lots of warnings on any dietary supplement about consult your healthcare provider before starting it, and then it goes into some special conditions on where you need to pay even more attention. And it is as a conventionalist here, I don't know how to work around that stuff because you know this, it's not being screened and tested for safety issues. So here's some examples of things gone wrong here. This is uh, the FDA does keep a list of, of um, warnings that come out here. I'll be able to show you in a minute. Um, and this is in 2010, FDA announced that this product here to help you breathe, so to speak, um, it's to, it, it's one of the things to advertise for healthy lungs, respiratory system, and kidney yang. I'm not sure what that is. But they found uh, presence of lead in there. And it contained um, 
over a thousand parts per million of lead, and that level is more than 10,000 times higher than the FDA's maximum recommended level for lead found in candy, which is kind of shocking. For those who have been around for a while, you may go back to the, the late 1980s. Um, tryptophan contaminants associated with um, a disease called eosinophilia myalgia syndrome here. Um, and basically, um, in New Mexico, a few patients started getting myalgias, and then they found their peripheral blood eosinophilia um, quite elevated. Um, when they went looking back to it, they found a contaminated tryptophan uh, component that is listed here. And um, they tracked it back to it was coming from this product itself. Uh, and when, when they removed the product from the market here, the cases of the um, eosinophilic myalgia syndrome went down. And here's another product I found online here. Um, Kella, it does contain furanochromones here, and they are converted to chromalin sodium, which we see in our world of allergy and asthma. Um, however, if you look at the special considerations, it says monitor your liver function results. Um, if you're doing buying this off uh, online, I'm going to bet you probably don't. Um, talks about cardiac workup um, if, with uh, anti-anginal um, hypotensive effects, anti-hypertensives, anti-coagulant, um, and not to use in pregnancy or breastfeeding, which is common. Um, by chance, uh, Kella is a member of the carrot family. I'm not so aware of any carrot allergies, but you could. Scratch your head on that one. All right, so um, quality and efficacy of the supplements here. There's a lot to think about with this because when somebody says, I'm taking echinacea, um, you go, okay, that's, well, is all echinacea the same? And the answer is no. Um, there are many different plant species. One company may use a different part of the plant, the root versus the leaf, the stem, the flower. Um, How is it harvested and stored? What about the processing along the way? How accurate is the labeling? Is there standardization and dosing? No. Um, what's the purity? And then again, what's the efficacy here? Um, I won't get this right, but echinacea, it's like there may be like nine different um, plants of echinacea here. Um, so, you know, a lot of things to think about. And unfortunately, we can't compare company A to company B on that. You have to look at the drug herb interactions. St. John's wort induces cytochrome P450, um, metabolizes a number of uh, drugs that we um, as physicians may use, like protease inhibitors, cyclosporin, oral contraceptives, um, et cetera. Um, and then ginkgo biloba has antiplatelet and antithrombotic effects. I've seen search pre-surgery uh, consents where they're asking about what, you know, over-the-counters do you use, what supplements, and this will be one of concern if you're going in for surgery and bleeding. Um, okay, so the, the FDA does have a MedWatch program that can include the various supplements along the way. Um, there's the, the link for that one. Um, here's an example of, of going into it here in the safety reporting. So you can actually report things yourself, and if there's enough noise about it, then it may you know, merit investigation or um, warning reports. And this is a, um, one of the um, FDA advises patients not to use this particular product here. Um, um, unfortunately, I can't read the, the full. Something about the quality issue is, that, is all I, I remember on this, but that's back in 2019. So um, there is a system to kind of look for this stuff, but obviously if you're not you know, actively looking, you won't know. Um, we have to remember that some of these uh, herbal products have unintended effects here. So you see some um, blood sugar issues related to nettle and ginseng here. Sol palmetto has some estrogenic effects. Uh, licorice is thought to cause some hypertension. Kava has hepatic injury. Um, if you go to up to date, they do have a little list of, of things that they have found to be common. Most of them all relate to hypertensive um, components here. but um, it's a, it's a nice resource on that. 
All right, now we're going to break into our world, the allergy, asthma, and immunology here. I'm trying my best to do a fair and balanced report. If it seems a little negative, it's just because the data is either unknown or proven to be negative here. As we get more data, we'll have more better information on it. Um, lots of information online here. Um, as we know a lot of people use these products. It was 42% use it for atopic disorders. Um, Here's a allergic rhinitis in traditional Chinese medicine. Um, eight herbs, they found no significant differences in symptom scores um, or rescue medication use. Um, here's the reference for that. I'm going to fly through these because of time management. And, um, up to date on the uh, allergic rhinitis in the Chinese um, medicines here. Um, 12 randomized controlled trials published 11 articles up till 2017. A lot of differences in the studies. The meta-analysis showed that um, Chinese medicine significantly improved quality of life compared, compared to placebo. We did say before that was significant, um, but there was no difference in symptoms of itchiness, sneezing, or total nasal symptom scores. If we look at allergic rhinitis and acupuncture, 116 articles reviewed 12 met inclusion criteria. No effects for seasonal, some benefit for perennial, not cost-effective uh, compared to, um, to medication use, and there was no medication reduction. Allergic rhinitis and butterbur. Um, so butterbur, the root extracts contain um, pedicins, and the thought is these may alter the leukotriene pathway. And uh, interesting, they found three of the six double-blind randomized control trials found butterbur favorable to cetirizine and fexofenadine. So that's encouraging. Um, and unfortunately, because it contains the, the pyrolizidine thought to be hepatotoxic, mutagenic, and carcinogenic, um, it's probably not going to be recommended there. And that was in uh, the Annals of Allergy. Capsaicin here, the red peppers. Um, they do desensitize nerve fibers and reduce nasal hyper-responsiveness here. Um, a study looking at that with allergic rhinitis and non-allergic rhinitis, and they did find a reduction in nasal symptom scores. It's available commercially. You can go find it online. You'll see some lookalikes out there, too. Um, for those of you who know Dr. Bernstein, um, it was one of his studies and published in the Annals in 2011. I'm going to switch over to lower respiratory tract here. I know this is bronchitis, not asthma. Um, I um, think I threw it in because I like licorice, <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, licorice has been uh, alluded to help with respiratory disease here, and this is the licorice plant. Um, it's the actual root is what they use. It's been looked at for ulcers to bronchitis and sore throat. It is a member of the pea family, so you could argue is there potential for if somebody has a pea allergy, that is there some clinical cross-reactivity? It's kind of an unknown. Um, it can be associated with uh, causing hypertension. Um, it may increase the proportion of other uh, medicines and may potentiate adverse effects of uh, corticosteroids. And when it's all said and done, um, the study, um, basically no evidence to support its use in bronchitis. This is asthma and allergic rhinitis along with uh, lactobacillus, um, which we find that in GIGU um, system here produces vitamin K lactase and antimicrobials here. When they looked at allergic rhinitis and Japanese cedar pollen treatment, it came back as grade C. And as you recall, most grade Cs are pretty neutral, not for, not against type thing. And when they looked at it for asthma, it was the same thing. And this is my resource again, Medline Plus. If you look at acupuncture, many small uncontrolled studies showing benefit. When you do the meta-analysis, um, it was not associated with significant clinical improvements. Um, again, mentioned small studies with limited information. If you look at asthma and chiropractic manipulation, and this is in children. You're not going to find tons in children here, but this is one. They looked at manipulation versus placebo and standard asthma care. They found no significant differences in AM peak flow symptoms, use of beta agonist quality of life spirometry or airway responsiveness. So did not favor chiropractic manipulation for asthma in kids. If you look at massage, uh, 20 minutes before bedtime, children, uh, young versus um, kind of middle of the pack here, um, young ones decrease in anxiety, attitude towards asthma and improve pulmonary function test over one month. If you look at the 9 to 14, decrease in anxiety and attitude towards asthma, but no improvement in spirometry. So, um, you know, massage therapy, I would think, 
just the time alone and the comfort and care would help with anxiety in general. Um, and then the lung function I can't explain in the four to eight year olds, but um, they saw some improvement. If you look at other various controlled breathing exercises here, um, there was no change in bronchial hyperresponsiveness or the methacholine challenge, no change in FEV1. They did report some fewer symptoms, so we're kind of back to the subjective report of that here, uh, but they also used uh, less bronchodilators. Biofeedback, um, most systematic reviews have not detected any change here. Um, here is this more recent study in uh, 2004, 94 asthmatics with training in heart rate, heart rate variability biofeedback, um, decreased meds, fewer symptoms, and improved PFT. There's a hint of a signal there. Um, switching gears over to upper respiratory infections, just because we deal with a, is it a cold nurse's allergy frequency? Here's that echinacea, oh, nine species mentioned earlier, um, varies per study and mixed results. Um, mix that on whether it's prevention um, or treatment um, on this, so not fully clear. Eczema and probiotics, lactobacilli may prevent development here. Um, but when you look at efficacy of um, oral live probiotics, here's the two that they use. Um, and this is in 2,599 adults and children. There was no difference in the severity of atopic during, during the SCORAD system or the quality of life. Primrose oil, uh, meta-analysis, no difference in global eczema symptoms. Eczema and zinc, um, as you know, zinc is a cofactor in many enzymatic functions here. Um, there is some evidence to suggest regulation of CD4, NK cells, and IL-2. Um, here's the various conditions um, not related, scalp fungal infection, grade B, immune function, which I never know what immune function by its name means. You'll find lots of supplements that claim to support immunity, and I don't know what that means. <laughs> it's kind of nebulous. Um, common cold, grade C, eczema, and psoriasis, grade C. And then with the ever-changing laws and frequency of use, I felt um, that I should add CBD uh, or cannabis into this here. I want you to know your patients are going to find this type of thing on the web, how CBD helps prevent inflammation and allergies, all the way to is it a, a, as an effective asthma treatment here. Of course, I love the website Medical Jane. Um, some pictures of the plants themselves here, um, and growing interest in this, marketed for numerous disorders. Legality has been in question between labeling and marketing on this whole, um, and as you know, it's changing state by state. Breaking it down a little bit, THC is the active ingredient or the psychoactive component. The products that we see frequently in the grocery stores, at least in our, our states, Kansas and Missouri here, um, is the cannabinoid diol, CBD, and then you'll see hemp and then other products here um, in it. FDA has approved the THC psychoactive component for these um, drugs here, uh, Pitodiolex. Um, and it's for certain seizure disorders here. Um, we've got Marinol capsules and Syndra's oral solution also out there. Um, switching gears over to hemp, just not to be confused with either CBD versus um, the THC component. Um, it's from the specific cannabis and sativa plant here. The consumption of the hemp seed derived in, uh, ingredients is not capable of causing the psychoactive component here. It doesn't contain the THC or the CBD. So when you read about hemp rope and hemp clothing and all that, that's not the, the same. Um, there was a study here, I believe this was in rats, if I'm thinking right, um, and it's looking at the four cytokines, um, IL-4, 5, 10, and 13, as you all know, are deeply involved in the um, allergic um, pathway here. Um, each one of these up here, and a little bit hard to say, uh, C is like IL-4, 5, 10, and 13. This is the control level of the uh, measured interleukin. Um, this is the asthmatic control, and this is the asthmatic with CBD. Um, and as I mentioned, I believe this is in rats here. But in, in short, what they're showing is the CBD uh, had some lower uh, measurements of these four um, cytokines. So not, not sure what to make of that, but that's what I know.
um, when you do speak with your, your patients about CAM, do you remember there's special populations that will be have less information and maybe higher risk here? So think of pregnancy and, and nursing, whether it be the teratogenic effect or the carryover in breast milk. Um, think about infants, uh, as we, we all know, they're not the same as adults. Think about the elderly. Um, and then finally, if somebody's going in for surgical, um, that can be a, certainly a, a risk factor if there's some uh, antiplatelet effect or cardiovascular um, related issues. Where to find information? Um, these are the websites that unfortunately my links didn't work to today. They did yesterday, don't get it today, but um, this is the, uh, the NIH related um, groups right up top here. Um, the, the other ones are kind of self-explanatory on where to go, but um, you know, think about getting some of this stuff available on your desktop versus your phone with some, one of the apps that I talked about, because um, these can be, um, I think, terribly helpful. Um, remember, we're there to help our patients and how to navigate it, so talk about the internet accessibility and information. Do remember to talk to them about the date of the information. Is it timely? I had a father who discussed for about 20 minutes with me some asthma management supplement, and he um, said he had the study and all that when he was kind enough to eventually forward it to me via email. Um, the, the data was from 1953 or something like that. So, um, you know, make sure it's timely. Um, review the source of the information. If, you know, if it's a manufacturer selling a product, their, their bias may be um, different than if it's from a you know, university academic center or government site, et cetera. Um, do check the references and the quality of the referred studies. I've seen um, some people uh, on their websites who advertise that there are studies to back it up and you can go click on their studies when you read them. They're actually negative reports, but nobody clicks on them to go look. So you might, um, if, you're, if you're going down that pathway, you might look in, in specifically to make sure things are on the up and up. So check the references and quality of referred studies. Um, do check the reviewers' qualifications here. Um, you know, I, I, I shouldn't be talking about heart disease as an allergist uh, in a big way. So you want to make sure you got the right people reviewing the right thing. And then certainly visit several sites. Um, be wary of um, vague terms like satisfaction, guaranteed, cure-all, miracle cure. Um, pseudo jargon like purify, detoxify, and energize. I don't know what all that really means in, in disease. Um, anecdotal evidence here, you'll see lots of personal testimonies. And I mean, that, that's powerful mainly if it's somebody you know that tells you this fixed whatever. But on the other hand, when you're reading it online and you don't know somebody um, and you know who, who did the, the actual testimony. Um, you will see some sites that have accusations against kind of the um, um, allopathic um, conventionalist medicine that we practice here. Uh, and then there's a, a lot of people that have that fear of the government too. Um, natural doesn't always mean safe. Tobacco is natural, right? Um, and then also be aware of the drug interactions like we talked about before. And UpToDate has a little schema for advice and patients about products here. And I, and I think it, it's pretty simple and it makes sense here. It's looking at quality, it's looking at efficacy, safety, and then what your clinical advice is. And it's just saying, you know, do, are these things present to say this is, a, is the right thing that's going to help you? Is it the right thing that's not going to hurt you? Who did the information? And then summing that all up with a final, yeah, that might be worth, worth using. So with that, we're at the end here. A um, little little humor, I'll say. Um, one cat saying, I, I take a lot of antioxidants. That's why I'm still in the first of my nine lives. Chris, Chris I have, I a, have a, um, a question. Or, I'm just, I'm just I'm curious, curious that, um, um, how you approach patients um, that um, will use things like chiropractic. Um, I had a patient a few years ago that um, um, believe that if they manipulated the C3, that that's how they would get rid of the asthma attacks. So how do you um, diplomatically talk to parents about things like that? Yeah, that's, that's a great point here. I, I used to share one. I was in the ICU on a child of RSV bronchiolitis who was going um, with respiratory failure, and we ended up intubating it. It was a, a, a well-meaning father who was telling me what he manipulated and kept the child out of the hospital for three days. And of course, in my head, I'm going, 
you're in the ICU and getting intubated right now. So um, that's that's a hard thing to approach here. But um, I I think one is tr- you know kind of understand why they went that direction and and did you know ask them do you think it helped and all that. And I wouldn't discount things up front, but then you know, trying to explain that from a long-term management, the science behind this would point that, you know, these are the recommended things we do. Um, and it, it is kind of a, you know, a, a touchy um, topic for people because, like I said, they, they invested themselves in doing this. And now you're going to, you're trying to say not the right thing. And um, yeah, so you have to walk gingerly. Okay. Anyone else have any questions for Dr. Miller? If not, um, we will um, end COLA for today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Miller, for taking the time to give this great talk. We appreciate your efforts, um, and everyone have a great and safe weekend. Thank you all. Bye-bye.